Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and we're taking a look today at a computer from Shuttle, a mini PC. This is the NC03U, and I was interested in testing this because this is one of the few uh, open-ended mini PCs powered by an Intel 3865U processor. And the reason why that processor is interesting to me is that it is from the KB Lake line of chips. So a lot of the mid to high end laptops we've looked at have the uh, more powerful versions of this processor inside of it, namely the i3, i5, and i7 chips. This is the uh, chip that sits below the i3 in that family. And Intel's always had a Celeron from their mainstream laptop chipset line available for uses like this. In fact, the Chromeboxes have been using these chips for a long time, and the current generation of Chromeboxes is also using this very same processor. So I wanted to get this one in from Shuttle just because it's an unrestricted uh, box. We can install Windows and Linux on it and see how it compares to uh, other machines out there. And I was very interested to see how this machine might compare to some of the Gemini Lake devices we've looked at recently here on the channel, the Intel NUC and a few of the other uh, lesser known brands of mini PCs that we've explored a bit. Uh, because what I found in my testing is that the high end of the low end is very much catching up with the low end of the high end, if that makes sense. There's less of a dividing line between these two families of processors now, and uh, we're at a point where I think you could actually uh, do pretty well with a lower powered mini PC and get very similar performance. We're going to be exploring that a bit in this video. Now, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this PC came in on loan from Shuttle. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review and no one has reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get to it now and see what this computer is all about and then we'll do some analysis. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. Now, because this device is running with a KB Lake processor, they have four different versions available, one for each chip in the product line. Uh, these are all seventh generation chips, so they're all dual core. Uh, the eighth gen version of these chips now is quad core. So maybe at some point we'll see a new version of this PC with more cores, but at the moment it is seventh generation only. Uh, again, this has a 3865U built in. Uh, this starts at $177 bare bones, which means there is no RAM or storage included. You have to add that yourself. I'm going to pop it open in a minute to show you where to do all of that. Uh, but they also have an i3 version available, and at the time that I'm recording this video, uh, the i3 version is selling for about the same price, around $177 for uh, the i3 or the Celeron. And of course, if you have that choice, the i3 is the better option because it will be a little bit faster. That might change as uh, time goes on here, but right now that's what I'm seeing. So if you see this one, get the i3 at the same price. It's a better deal. Uh, they also have an i5 at $459 bare bones, so the price escalates very quickly here. And there's an i7 version available for $512. Of course, the i5 and the i7 will deliver uh, much better performance, especially for uh, video streaming and other kinds of activities. But if you're looking for something low end, uh, I think $177 for a uh, bare bones PC with this chipset is not a bad deal, especially if you can find the i3 for that price. Now to put the RAM and whatnot into this device, there are um, two ways to get into the computer. Uh, so you can pop off the top uh, portion here and you can also do the same here with the bottom portion. I've already unscrewed everything so it just kind of pops right off. Uh, so it's not hard to get into it to uh, start installing stuff. And this one came with a SSD hard drive installed already. So you have for storage uh, the option to use a uh, regular SATA drive if you wish, but there is also an M2 slot here on the top uh, for one of those longer M2 drives. It supports both the uh, M2 SATA format, so you can run a SATA drive in that slot, or you can use a PCI Express hard drive in that same slot, an NVMe drive for better performance. So I did a video comparing those two technologies uh, a little bit earlier this month, so you can check that out. But those just go right into that slot. The SATA or the NVMe will work in there, and you're good to go. So you have two storage options available to you. What's funny is the RAM installs on two different parts of the motherboard. So one stick 
uh, goes over here and the other one goes on the bottom. Uh, this supports DDR4 RAM and it will support dual channel configuration for better graphics performance too. So uh, altogether a, a pretty nice computer from the standpoint of getting inside and messing around with it and it's nice that you don't have to take the whole motherboard out to uh, add storage or RAM to the mix. Uh, the maximum RAM on this one is 32 gigabytes so you can have uh, two sticks of 16 in here if you want to go that far. Uh, or you can run it with 8 gigs like we're doing here, and that seems to be working just fine. Let's take a look now and see what kind of ports we have on this after I put it back together. So on the front of the computer here, you've got a USB 3.0 port. Uh, next to it is a USB Type-C port, uh, but this one is just a data port running at Gen 1 5 gigabit per second speeds. It's essentially the same port as this larger one, just in a USB form factor. It is not a full service port either, so no video or power delivery here, uh, just data out uh, to your devices, and that is it. It'll probably charge something like this port will, but you're not going to be able to run a single cable dock, for example, to the uh, device here to get everything up and running. Uh, right here you have a SD card slot. You can stick a card in there. It'll stick out a little bit, but you've got that available to you. Power button is over here. On this side, you just have a Kensington lock slot, and you have a vent for the built-in fan and heat sink. It doesn't generate that much noise at all. Probably one of the quieter fans I've seen on a uh, fan-equipped mini PC. It really is quite quiet, which is good if you are looking for relatively close to silence uh, operation here. Uh, your power supply goes in here. It has an HDMI port, but unfortunately, uh, this port maxes out at 30 frames per second at 4K. Uh, we're always looking for 60 frames per second performance out of these devices, and we're not seeing it here, at least with the HDMI port. Uh, this will also not work with Netflix's DRM either, at least off of the HDMI. We did try to get that working, so I think this might be a, a version 1.4 port that they chose to put on here. Uh, the chipset, of course, does support uh, 60 hertz, but this one just does not. Uh, the display port port we had better luck with, so that does support 4K at 60 hertz. Uh, so if you are connecting up a 4K display, be sure to use display port for that. You got gigabit Ethernet here and two USB 3.0 uh, ports, excuse me, the uh, slower USB ports on the back. So this is probably where you'll want to attach your keyboards and mice and that sort of thing. And right here you have your headphone jack. Uh, there's also a Visa mount in the box that you will attach here on the side if you want to mount it on the back of your monitor. And then right here is a serial port. We don't see these too often these days on modern PCs, but Shuttle often includes these because I think they have a lot of these mini PCs in industrial environments where they're controlling machinery and that kind of thing, and serial ports are still very relevant there. So you do have that uh, port built right in so you can get your serial devices going on it. So that is it for the overall pricing and hardware configuration. Let's take a look now and see how it performs. So we're going to kick things off with some web browsing. You can see we're going to the nasa.gov site and everything is very snappy as it typically is with a KB Lake processor, even the low-end one we're playing with here. So all was good on that front. We also visited my YouTube channel and watched a 1080p 60 frames per second video. We did have a couple of drop frames, but I think that was just something happening with the system in the background. We typically see these chips uh, performing just fine on 60 frames per second video, and the frame drops are not something I am concerned about. They weren't consistently dropping. So overall, I think a good Netflix and YouTube streaming device provided you're only doing that at 1080p if you're looking for the maximum frame rate. So not bad uh, as a general use kind of PC, but again, I was a little disappointed we didn't have better uh, 4K performance out of the back of that HDMI port. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 73.7 on the 1.0 version of that test. That compares to 65.8 on the high-end Gemini Lake chip we had on an Intel NUC we looked at recently, so they're very close here on that benchmark. And we also have a Chewy G box on the list, which represents some of the uh, Chinese boxes we get in from time to time. That has a lower-end Gemini Lake processor, an N4100, and that one came in at 49.7 on version 1.0. And then at the higher end is the same computer with the i5 processor. They called it the NC03U5. Uh, that one came in at 106 on the version one of that test. So you can see how things can escalate in performance as you spend more money. 
Uh, but nonetheless, there are basically stops along the way here at just about every performance level on that speedometer benchmark. So let's take a look now at some gaming. We've got Minecraft running on it, the Java version of Minecraft that most people still run. Uh, we installed the Optifine Performance Enhancer. At 1080p, we're getting about 20 to 30 frames per second, but seeing a lot of lag mixed into uh, the gameplay there. So not a great Minecraft experience. You'll probably do better with the Windows 10 version of Minecraft. We ran Rocket League at its lowest settings at 1080p, and there we were seeing frame rates at around 30 frames per second. So it was playable, but a little ugly, uh, given that you can't put a lot of nice graphical uh, enhancements into the mix without killing the performance completely, but you can get there a little bit with it. Uh, we also ran Fortnite on it, because that's what everybody's playing these days. Uh, that game was getting about 20 to 30 frames per second, but like Minecraft, we were seeing some lag mixed in as uh, new textures and other things were coming into play there. So just like many other low-cost mini PCs, this thing is not going to be very well suited for playing modern games, but it will do very well with older games along with retro emulation. It'll even run the Dolphin emulator fairly well at around 30 frames per second on uh, most of the lower impact games that might be out there. So it's not a bad uh, little chipset here. Just don't expect uh, to do anything beyond playing some of that older stuff or streaming games uh, from a more powerful gaming PC from somewhere else in your house. We also ran the 3D Mark CloudGate benchmark test and we got a surprising result there on the Celeron version of the shuttle. Uh, the score we got was 3,218, which is lower than what we saw out of the Intel Gemini Lake NUC with the J5005 processor. Uh, that one came in at around the same graphical performance as the uh, 3865U shuttle here, but the CPU performance on the NUC was a little better, and that's because that NUC is powered by a quad-core processor, whereas this one is just a dual-core chip. So this one will do better in single core kind of operations, but if you got more cores, you're going to get better performance. And we certainly saw that uh, with the test, as you can see here on screen. Uh, we also compared it with the shuttle that has the i5 processor built in. You can see it does uh, much better with that chip for that test. So you might be able to play a few more games on the i5 version versus the uh, Celeron here. And then the Chewy G box, you can see, is a lot lower uh, coming in at scores that uh, you would maybe expect from a PC that costs around 150 bucks fully equipped. So generally, I think it performs well. Uh, but again, the lines are blurring between Gemini Lake here and uh, KB Lake in that the low-end stuff is actually starting to catch up a bit. And that was a bit of a surprise when we were testing this particular computer. Now, this does have a fan inside, as we mentioned earlier, that's not very loud. Uh, so it will attempt to keep the computer cool. And we ran the 3D Mark stress test to see whether or not the computer throttles, even though it has the fan built in. As computers get hotter nowadays, they slow down to prevent overheating. Uh, there we got a score of 95.5% on that test, which means there's going to be a little bit of throttling, probably nothing noticeable. A passing grade on that test is 97%. And the i5 chip came in at 94%, but as you can see, it runs a lot hotter than the Celeron version does. Uh, but nonetheless, it came in close to the same score insofar as what kind of throttling uh, was detected on the machine while it was under load. So all in, not bad. Let's take a look now though at home theater, and that's an area where, as I mentioned, that HDMI port might become a bit problematic. Uh, the first issue, of course, is that we can't get 60 frames per second output on it, but it was able to pass digital audio over to my receiver just fine, including lossless audio. Uh, we had some Dolby True uh, HD audio passing through in our test earlier. DTS HD also worked, uh, and it was able to play back HEVC Blu-ray uh, movies without any issues either at 4K. You can see a test running here that we like to run, which is a 140 megabit per second HEVC 4K file. Uh, that one decoded without any drop frames either because these chips, even the Celeron here, uh, have the ability to decode HEVC video very efficiently. So altogether, uh, good playback experience, but that HDMI port is going to be limiting in that it won't support Netflix 4K, it won't support 60 hertz, and it certainly doesn't support, unfortunately, HDR either. All right, one last thing to check out here, and that is its Linux performance. We're running Ubuntu 18.04 right now. Seems to be running just fine. Uh, Wi-Fi works, video works. Uh, audio works on it as well, so all the things that typically trip you up are not tripping us up here. 
I did notice though that Bluetooth didn't work and I initially thought it was a compatibility issue. It just doesn't have Bluetooth built in by default. And also the wireless radio on here, whether you're in uh, Windows or Linux, only supports 2.4 gigahertz radios. So it's A, B, G, and N, uh, but no AC. So it's a very limited bare bones computer, but I think if you can get the i3 around 150 or 170 bucks bare bones, that's not a bad deal. It'll be a nicely performing computer. You will have the issues with the 4K port uh, not getting you 60 hertz, but you can hook up the display port to your monitor, for example, for that. So it's probably not the most ideal home theater PC, unfortunately, but I think for the price point, you might be able to get yourself a good deal on a nicely performing computer. So if you're looking at a Chromebox and you like the form factor and you like the performance you've seen in reviews, but you want something more open-ended, uh, this certainly will give you that flexibility in a similar form factor with the same chip. Uh, you can run Windows and Linux and whatever else you can possibly think of on here. It's really an open book with zero restrictions, whereas the Chrome boxes certainly will limit you uh, to Chrome OS unless you do some real serious shoehorning. And it's just so much easier to buy something that's out of the box ready to go with your operating system of choice than it is to try to get a Chrome box to cooperate. Uh, what really surprised me, though, is just how close the uh, low and mid-range uh, processors are getting to each other. That J5005 NUC really performed quite well against this one to the point where I think an average user really can't tell the difference between uh, two different types of processor families. And that was really a surprising thing to me. I was still expecting to see a broader uh, performance gain here out of this one than we saw uh, versus the J5005 NUC we reviewed. That said, if you can get the i3 version of this, it's probably a much better deal right now because it's the same price uh, versus the 3865U in here. And that will certainly give you a broader performance boost over the Gemini Lake equipped NUC. But there are a lot of choices out there now. And I think what you have to do is look for what your needs are. Uh, if you're running a DisplayPort monitor and you don't mind the HDMI being limited on this thing, then this is probably the way to go. But if you've got HDMI displays, you want 60 hertz going out to them at 4K, then the NUC might be a better option to pursue in addition to the fact that the NUC has better Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in too. So there's no just one go-to mini PC for me at the moment. We'll keep looking around and trying to find some more and let me know if there's any I should look at down in the comments below. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, The Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Gerard Newberg, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.